Hello, everyone, and welcome to the, I guess, IoT show that used to be called Things on Thursdays. We're actually back on Thursday today as part of our sort of wandering schedule. And if you are new to this, we are currently in the middle of a project. So we sort of do projects on this show that involve Redis and quite often microcontrollers or single board computers, usually the Raspberry Pi line of stuff because it's easy to get hold of and well documented. And um, sometimes you'll see Arduino things on here and sometimes some, some other outliers, depending on what I can get my hands on and what we can make Redis or Redis clients run on. Um, that's usually quite a broad range of things because the protocol is pretty easy to get running on most little devices as long as you've got some sort of network connection um, and the ability to handle strings. It's a string-based protocol. A while ago in this series, so if you go back in my, my playlist on the YouTube channel, um, which you can find there, um, you'll see that we actually talked about that protocol and how to mimic it and sort of build a fake Redis server that could do a couple of things that uh, a full Redis server can. So what are we up to at the moment? Um, we've been building something that somebody in the community wanted to know, can you store image data inside a Redis database? And the answer is basically yes, because you can store this stuff as anywhere, anywhere that expects a Redis string and Redis strings are binary safe. So that's kind of like the sort of boring theoretical answer. We decided we'd put this into practice and uh, store some images and fetch them back out again. So we've been doing that with a Raspberry Pi to capture the images because this is an IoT show, you know, that's our, our angle. And we've been doing it with the Flask front end to show the, uh, the data in the web. And what we did was we started out with a fairly naive way of uh, retrieving these images and showing them. Um, we were just using the Redis scan command and pulling all of these images out of Redis hashes. And we'll look at that in a moment. And in the last show, we replaced that with something that was Redis stack search based. So we started to use something that was a bit more scalable, give us a little bit of ability to pick and choose what images appear in the front end and filter them. And then the aim of this project going forwards is to do something interesting with those on the front end. But what I wanted to do in this stream today is go through some changes I've made to the image capture component. So we had an image capture that ran on a timer and it just took an image every so many seconds, um, not particularly interesting. So we've changed that to do something else. And we're gonna look at that, but let's uh, just Spend a second and share the desktop here. Here we go. There we go. Um, so what we've got is, this is just some slides we're going to look at uh, what we've built so far. We've got a Raspberry Pi with a camera module attached. If you've seen the previous streams, um, if not, go find them on YouTube. You'll see that we started out with a non-focusing version of the camera module, and we swapped it out for a focusing one, which is a lot better. So you can like auto-focus on an object. And what we're doing is we've written some Python that reads from this sensor or the camera sensor every uh, so many seconds at the moment and puts the data in Redis. So I'm running a Pi 3B. It's just what I happen to have on the shelf. Anything with uh, the camera connector will be fine. So you could run this on a two, three, four, uh, possibly a zero. I don't actually know too much about the zero line. Um, but anything with a camera connector is, is going to be fine. And then what's happening here, if we just step through this, is we're using a Redis database and we're using Redis stack, which will sort of come to why we're doing that later. And what we're doing is creating a hash. So like a sort of name value pair, it's a single Redis key or a series of name value pairs, a map of those things, a single Redis key for each image that we take. And I decided to use timestamps as kind of like the unique key value. So we're storing our images as image, colon, and the timestamp, Unix timestamp that they were saved at or created at. And then I'm storing some fields. We get a lux value from the camera, which is a, uh, a feel for how light the background was at the time, what the lighting situation was. Uh, I'm storing the timestamp separately so that I can search on it and report on it if I need to. 
I'm storing the mime type to give the front end an idea of what this binary blob in Redis actually represents. And then we're storing the image data just as a binary string. So what happens up till now is there's a timer that runs on the Pi and like every 10 or so seconds or whatever we configured it to be, we will create a new one of these hashes in Redis. Um, and what else were we doing there was we realized that we kind of had a runaway data problem here. So all the data in Redis lives in memory, lives in RAM. It gets backed up and persisted to disk, but a copy of the entire data set needs to be in RAM. So when we're capturing images, and you know these are like uh, 4,000 pixels by whatever it works out to be in a 16.9 format um, images, they're reasonably high resolution. They take up some decent amount of memory. And what is happening with the, uh, the Redis instance, if we did this approach, would be that we would just eventually fill up the finite amount of memory that we've got in there. So what I was doing as part of one of the previous streams was also setting an expiry on this. So after a certain amount of time, the data will expire, Redis will consider it deleted, it will vanish from the front end, and the resources associated with storing it in Redis will be freed up for another image in future. So we sort of solved our, um, our problem there. And yeah, we're not building like a data warehouse system for images here. We're building something that looks at like a snapshot in time over a period of images. And then maybe eventually we'll do some work on those images. Like, you know, did the thing that trigger a sensor to take the picture, was that like an animal in my garden or was it a person crossing a threshold or was it a product going by on a conveyor belt or, or some, you know, there's multiple industrial or data gathering uses for these where the images themselves aren't the artifact we want to keep forever. We just want to keep them around, do some processing on them, and then we can bin them later. Um, or perhaps we want to keep them in a way that, you know, somebody reviews them and then they, they get moved to a sort of permanent data warehouse later. So that was what we got on the ingestion side. And we built a front end using Python and Flask. So I'm trying to keep this an all Python project. Um, there is really no uh, hard and fast rules as to what you build the front end with. Anything will work. We could have used Node and Express. We could have used C Sharp and an appropriate web framework. Could have written it in Go. Anything with a Redis client. There's nothing connecting the fact that a Python script put the data into Redis with whatever language we use to get it out. They're completely uh, independent of each other. And they just both understand these, these hashes and what to expect inside them. So there's our front end. And what I did was made it pretty basic front end um, because I'm not a front end developer. So what it's doing is it's showing the nine most recent images and you know, as the camera took more of them, you would expect the, the other ones to sort of shuffle off the list eventually. And then they'd expire out of Redis anyway after a period of time and, and just go away. So we were doing that and we were pulling the, um, pulling the uh, information out of those hashes too. And we were doing that with Redis search in the last uh, example. So that's a, a capability of Redis stack, which is Redis plus some extra capabilities. Um, we're using the search one to give us criteria. So we could do a search for, you know, find us all of the images where the timestamp is between this number and this number. And then we've got like a date range search. Or we could say, find everything where the lux values are greater than so-and-so. And then we've got uh, images where it was daytime search. Or, you know, conversely, we could say where it's much lower. And then we've got an images from nighttime search. And we can combine all of these criteria and build some pretty complicated queries. So hopefully we'll go there in a future stream. But what I'm going to do right now is just sort of switch over to let's look at that front end. So this is it running on, um, on my machine locally. Redis is running somewhere else on my network. And the Pi is pointing at that. So. These are some images from the last stream where I temporarily removed the expiry so that we would just have a nice data set to kick around and look at the search queries. So these haven't expired. 
Um, what we'll do in this stream is show how uh, we've changed the capture mechanism to have a trigger rather than a timer. And we'll look at the data flowing through and expiring. And we'll look at how we did the trigger. So we're not going to do any front end building out on this stream. I was hoping to, but didn't have time to do the, do the prep, unfortunately. So what we'll do is um, is look at the the front end change, or sorry, the, the capture changes. And the front end essentially is unchanged for this uh, this live stream. So if you wanted to follow along, we have all the source code. It's here in GitHub. I'm trying to keep up with writing it up as we go. Um, and you'll find it there. I'll post that in the chat as well. So um, let us post that in the chat really quickly. Let's post that in the chat really quickly. So I'm using the Bluetooth keyboard and sometimes it just goes to sleep. Um, there we go. So you can find that if you want to follow along. Um, we've got everything documented in here, including what you need for this. This is the capture unit. It's like say a Raspberry Pi 3B. It's just in any old case. And I happen to attach the camera with tape, uh, just plain old electrical tape. So in this stream, we've added a second sensor and we've attached that with some more tape because why not? And we'll look at how that works. So that's the source code. There's the front end. Let's um, turn that off a minute. And as you can see, we haven't captured any images for a while. These are like from a previous live stream and I turn the expiry off. So what we're gonna do today is change over the front end, or oh, sorry, I keep saying front end, change over the capture unit. What we've got at the moment is Raspberry Pi. So over there on the right, it's a Raspberry Pi 3B. And over on the left, we've got a camera module. We started out with camera module two, which is like really old. It's from 2016. It's quite hard to buy and it doesn't have autofocus. I just happen to have it around the place. Um, and after we had some success with that and sort of saw that out of focus pictures weren't much fun, I went and got the camera module three, which is something you can buy now. Um, and that has the autofocus. It has a slightly higher resolution. It's a different sensor. Um, but code wise, it's almost the same. So if you want to see how that differs in the previous stream, we looked at how to set up and configure autofocus, start an autofocus cycle when you want to take a picture. And then storing it in Redis was exactly the same. It just um, was a stream of binary bytes. There's just more of them because it's a higher resolution sensor. So what we want to do today is look at uh, replacing our timer trigger with one of these, which is a sound sensor. So this thing isn't a microphone as such, so it doesn't record. Yeah, you know, we can't get the sound waves. Think of it more like a sort of have we hit a number of decibels trigger. So this will listen to background noise and it will send a pin high if it goes above a certain uh, level. And then there's that blue thing there with a the screw block in it. That's a potentiometer. So we can tweak that with the screwdriver and adjust the level at which this thing fires. When I first started looking at this, I was like, oh, great, we'll be able to get like a some sort of number out of this. And I think it's like between naught and 65,000 and something. Um, and you can, but the Raspberry Pi itself doesn't support analog uh, data like that. You know, there's no analog pins on the Pi header as such. And I've forgotten about this because I've been off working with the little Pi Picos quite a lot and they do have that. So instead, the way this is going to work on a Raspberry Pi is it's going to be more like, was a noise made, yes or no? And you can think of that potentiometer as our sort of threshold controller. So rather than get a number back and decide in software, oh, is the number greater than like the number that we want to trigger at? Uh, you actually have to go tweak the hardware and we'll just get a zero or one. You know, zero is nothing's happened. One is something was loud and, and happened. Um, and how we're gonna connect that up to the Pi is pretty simple. Uh, it just takes, it's got three pins on here. It needs a power supply. So we're gonna give it three and a bit volts power. 
Uh, it might be able to take five volts. I don't know, I didn't want to risk blowing it up before a live stream. And then it needs a ground. Uh, so the Pi can tell the difference between uh, the sort of one and zero states. And then it needs a data pin. So I've put it onto GPIO 17 up there, but that's a completely arbitrary choice. We just need to remember which one we've connected it to. So two things is number one, we have two sensors now. We have the camera and we have the sound sensor that we're gonna use as the trigger. These connect to the Pi in different places, which is good because it means we have loads of the GPIO pins available if we wanted to add anything else. So say we wanted a more complicated trigger, like we wanted sound and some sort of motion detection, like we were going for animals or something, then we could combine the data from these two sensors and build some logic that says something like, if there's motion and we heard something, then take a picture in case it's an animal and then do some sort of background processing in Redis or with the data that's stored in Redis, come back and, and you know figure out how we want to classify that image. I'm kind of hoping we can take this project somewhere in that direction over the coming how many live streams we stick with this one. So yeah, this is where we're at. Um, what I wanted to do really quickly as well was just look at the data in Redis as a reminder. So here we've got Redis Insight. It's a free graphical tool for looking at and manipulating data in Redis. And what you can see is I've got all of these hashes. And if I pick one, what you see is we've got the data that came from the camera. So as you'll see in previous streams, the camera script creates a hash with this key name. It normally sets a time to live as well. So how long before this expires? I disabled these just so I have that test data set for now. Then we can see the lux value from the camera sensor, how much light there was, the actual image data, um, the MIME type that we're putting in there so that front ends understand how to, um, how to interpret this data, and then a timestamp for search purposes. Um, so we've got all of these values and we're using search so we can ask it questions about the values that don't involve just simply getting a key. We can ask it things like, oh, give me everything with timestamps between this one and like 200 seconds before this one. And it will give us everything in that time period. If you want to see how that works, check out the previous stream. So yeah, we have all of this data in here um, and what we will do when we add some more is it'll go back to having the TTL because I put that back in the code and we can see that disappear. So what we need to do is replace our timer, which was just a simple while true sleep loop in the Python with something a bit better that uses this sensor here. So first thing, but like what is this sensor? Um, it's one of these, it's available from popular auction sites and also popular online uh, e-commerce sites, except it's currently unavailable here to us in the UK, but they're fairly easy to find. Uh, it's generally known as a dollar tech sound sensor. Uh, you want the one that says FCO4 on it like this and has the three pins um, and this potentiometer. And oh, it does say it'll work within five volts. So I might try that off stream just to see if giving it a bit more voltage gives us a greater range of sensitivity adjustment or not. But I really didn't want to like put it up at the, the higher end, blow it up and then be like, well, we have no stream today because Simon destroyed the sensor. Um, these things aren't expensive. I think they were about three pounds. So I do have a couple of them because um, I try and always buy a backup thing when I'm doing it for the first time because you never know. So yeah, that's the sensor we've got. Um, and then having had a look around at how you work with these with the Pi specifically rather than the Pico, so there's no analog digital conversion in here. We'd have to add that in hardware somewhere. We're just going to get zeros and ones. So I opted to use a basic script that looks like this to test the thing out. So here we're just basically declaring that the sensor's on pin 17 and we want that to be an input. So if you're familiar with Raspberry Pi GPIO, this is fairly common stuff. We set up a pin to say it's uh, an input and we tell uh, the Raspberry Pi to use what's called a 
pull up or down resistor. So it's kind of software thing in this case to let us know what the steady state needs to be because otherwise it will kind of flat because of the nature of electronics. So we're saying just assume it's uh, pulled up by default. And then what I'm doing here is adding an event detection uh, callback and says whenever pin 17 rises, so whenever you see the voltage on it increase, and with a bounce time of, if you haven't seen this in the last 300 milliseconds, so we don't get flooded with events when it happens, then run the callback named on sound. And all on sound is doing is just incrementing a global variable that's a counter, printing out that we received some sound. And uh, then we've just got a thing down here while true loop that's basically stopping the program from exiting. So these events can happen. Um, could probably just use pause in Python. And I think I did that in the actual code that we'll look at later. But that's basically how we're going to detect some sound. Um, I've tuned the potentiometer and we'll see what sort of level we get from that. But let's take a look at where the uh, where the thing is at the moment. It's over there on another bit of the desk. Let's remove this code. So it's over there and the, uh, the sound sensors on the top of it and the camera's pointing at currently a, a bunch of Raspberry Pi stuff boxes. So we'll take some pictures of those shortly. But what I wanted to do was run this code first, the, uh, the sound demo code here, and see what happens when we when we run it, make sure it's, you know, it's going to work with a basic uh, script. And then talk about some complexities that I found when I actually tried changing this over to, OK, let's take a picture and store it in Redis in the callback. So we don't need that shell. We do need this shell. And we'll make it nice and, oops, nice and big. So I'm logged into the, the Raspberry Pi that's down there at the moment. And let's do. Let's do clear and Python sound test dot pi. And what we should see is if I make enough noise, it will trigger the thing. And it's kind of hopefully working like I thought, which is I can speak and I'm far enough away from it and pointing in the other direction that I've not triggered it. But let's see if we can do. There we go. So if I go over there and click my fingers and make a decent amount of noise near to that sensor, it triggers. And what you can see, because we set the debounce time, is that I just get one trigger per loud noise. So I'm left-handed. I should really use the left hand. But even right-handed, I can still trigger it. So what you can see here is that it's configured at a level, and that's through adjusting the potentiometer. Um, if we had a Pico and an analog digital conversion thing, which the Pico supports or supports more readily, it's built in, we could get actual sound level numbers, but I'm treating this as a zero or one, which is okay. It just means that imagine I installed this in a bird box or something in the yard or a hide and I wanted to change my threshold, I got to go down there with the screwdriver and I've got to, let's just bring this back. I've got to change this potentiometer because I can't set it to be like really trigger happy uh, and have it fire the Python script all the time and then work out what the actual value was in the Python script because I'm dealing with um, digital logic here on the Pi. I'm not dealing with analog. So zero or one is not naught to 65,000 or what have you. Um, and that's something that if you were building a system like this, you probably want to address and you can get analog to digital converters that would sit between this and the Pi and then give us a, a, a more meaningful data stream. Or we could go attach this thing to a Pi Pico and like connect the Pi Pico to the Pi and do it that way. Um, but yeah, if you're thinking about building something like this, then maybe doing it in a way that you don't have to go out and field maintain your volume level uh, is good, especially if you're building lots and lots of these and putting them all over the place in like inaccessible positions. So we have that and we have the sound working and it's still maintaining a fairly good, it's not firing just with me talking. And so it's just one more time. 
it's working pretty well. So we can stop this now. And what we want to see here is basically how do we, let's run through this. It should be fairly easy to extrapolate how you take this code and convert the code that we had into using it. So we had a while true loop that took a picture. So what needs to happen is that while true loop needs to become this sort of callback trigger code. And then we need to set up the GPIO pin, the same that we've done here, and run that callback trigger code whenever um, the sensor triggers, you know, GPIO rising is going off, it runs the code. We'll take the picture and the picture will appear in Redis. And from there, we can refresh our front end. So what I'm going to do is swap to a VS code here and have a look at our capture code, which I did change in between live streams. So we can sort of talk through what's different here. Um, so basically, what's going on with our capture code is you'll see this in previous streams. We pull some configuration values from the um, from an environment file. This one actually is now redundant. I could get rid of that. So what we were doing before was capturing an image every so many seconds. And we don't need that anymore because I've introduced uh, some others to control the microphone sensor. But basically, we have config parameters for how long to keep the image in Redis, how long before it expires, whether our camera module has an autofocus mode or not, because that slightly affects the code path for how you take the picture. Um, that was in the previous stream. And then what's new here is I've added what ping can we expect the sound sensor to be connected to. Um, didn't see the point of hard coding that, so I just put it in the environment file. And also um, what that debounce time is. So if an event fires, if the sound sensor fires an event, how long should occur before we want to consider it as a new event? So the way that these things work is, is the GPIO signal rises. It generally, if you don't do debouncing, it's going to generate lots and lots and lots of events. And we don't want to get in a constant loop of like, oh, we're always taking pictures because um, we've called this thing too often. So think of this as a sort of um, a back off period. Um, and I had some challenges with doing this, with taking the photos and I'll talk about those and maybe why I might want to change the approach to this in future. But I'm going to skip over some of this. We set up some preamble for the camera. That's all covered before. Um, we connect to Redis. So again, we're getting Redis uh, as a URL from the M file. Um, a URL for Redis looks a bit like this. I'm actually running it on another machine on my local network, but it could be in the cloud or it could be actually running on the Pi. It could be anywhere you like. Um, and let's just collapse some stuff down. And what's new from the previous stream and similar from that example code that we just ran is I'm setting up the pin to be a pull up input pin and I'm adding an event detection callback. So when the GPIO rises and if however many milliseconds haven't occurred since the last time this happened, then run the on sound callback. And before I had a uh, while true loop, I've replaced that with a pause, which I think comes from, yeah, it comes from the signal library in Python. Um, basically just halts the main thread and lets other things happen so these callbacks can run. And we basically just don't want this to quit. Yeah, you know, we want to have a sort of server set up here that's just listening. And if we did have something to deal with shutdown gracefully, so we were handling control C or something, we could quit the Redis client nicely and disconnect and free up the resources, tell the server this client's not coming back. Um, I just put that in there as an example of good behavior. This code's actually unreachable at the minute because when you control C, it's just going to stop. But that's OK. So our big change is we used to have a uh, while true sleep 10 seconds or configurable number seconds loop. And that's been replaced by, well, essentially this line of code that just says, whenever the system detects this event is happening, so in the hardware across the GPIO pins, you want to run that on sound callback. 
and our on sound callback here expects one parameter called channel, which is basically the pin number that fired it. We don't really need to use that value because we have got, we've only set up this callback to run against one pin. So it's always going to be the value of sound sensor pin, which is always going to be 17 because that's what it's configured to. And that's where the microphone's connected. And what you'll see is when this happens, we have the same code that we used to have that goes ahead and takes the picture. And the sort of quick version of this is it takes the picture into a bytes IO object or a stream in Python that looks like a file. And then we save it into a Python dictionary and we give the dictionary some field names, which are the things we want to store in Redis. And then here is where I'm storing it in Redis. So I'm pipelining a couple of commands so that they go across the network at the same time for efficiency. I'm H setting the Redis key to whatever the value of this dictionary is. So it's setting all of those values at once. And then I'm setting an expiry time so the image will be or the whole hash will be considered deleted by Redis after so many seconds. And that will free up the resources. And as you can see now, this doesn't run in a loop. So this is a like run on demand. It's just a function that does this once. At the bottom here, we have some code to print out other metadata that comes back from the camera so we could see what was available. And there's no loop in here anymore. So off it goes. And what I found with this was that tweaking this bounce time is actually quite important. And that's what I'm not really satisfied with with this solution. So in the previous code where I was just logging, you know, zero, one, two, whatever, whenever the, here we go, uh, whenever the, uh, the microphone fired, that obviously runs very, very quickly. So the callback finishes quickly. This one can take a few seconds because the camera is going to do an autofocus cycle if it's an autofocus one and then it's going to lock on something then we're going to take the picture and then we're going to form up this object and then we're going to transfer that across the network to redis and the picture is like at least a megabyte in size so it takes a little time and what i found was if we don't if we set the debounce time too short what will happen is I think what's happening, but I couldn't really prove it, is that the event gets, or the code that handles this, thinks that the callback, something has gone wrong and just runs it again because it's not finished fast enough. So what I did was sort of tune this up and I basically get this, I think 10 seconds. Um, so it's got plenty of time to run without like auto triggering itself and then going into this spiral of, oh, I need to save more and more of the same image to Redis because it's taking a moment. Um, what I think I would do to get around this because, you know, that become this debounce milliseconds then becomes like a bit of a magic number. And there's variables in here like your network time and how big your image is and how long the camera takes to autofocus. So you're just kind of guessing and going with either a really big number that is longer than this process could ever possibly take or something that is like an 80% case where sometimes it's going to screw up and take multiple pictures. And what I think I would do is rather than uh, using event detection here is the GPIO library has the ability to synchronously wait until the thing rises. And I think I'll probably go back to sort of having a, a wild true loop and instead of having a sleep, have a synchronously wait for it to rise and then run all of this code that's in on sound uh, anyway. So I might change that around. It's kind of working pretty well at the moment, but um, I'm not so sure that this is like the greatest solution given the amount of variables in the time it takes the callback to run. So I guess what we should do is go ahead and run this and see what happens. So let's uh, do live demos and hope that, hope that things don't go wrong. So again, here I'm logged into the Pi. We've got the uh, GitHub repo on it. So if I run Python capture.py, hopefully something new will happen and hopefully something will appear in here. And hopefully that same thing, because it's in Redis, we can look at it in Redis Insight and see what's happening. So 
let's do python oops python capture.py let's start it up and if i talk for a moment let's see if it triggers it well it's not triggering it so it's behaving the same way as the other script would which makes sense because the level is set by the potentiometer in the hardware you know we haven't been over there and, and changed that with the screwdriver so if i go fire it we can see that we got some output there we stored a new image and hopefully there we go so we now have a new image from right now that um was taken by the camera triggered by the sensor uh not a timer so the camera is not producing images at a 10 second rate anymore it's now event driven and let's go have a look in redis and check this one out because this one should have the expiry time set because we put that code back in again so if i refresh this and let's get the key name or get the endpoint of the key name here the id what we should be able to do is go here and filter for that key and do image colon that there it is and we can see it's got four minutes left to live in redis i think we set a five minute ttl to start with or 245 seconds and here you'll see if we um we turn the refresh on on this you can literally watch it um count that value down so this image will disappear after 223 seconds and that was how we were managing our memory um so let's not wait around for that to happen we can just uh destroy it in redis inside there and then when we refresh the front end oh we took another one in the meantime look um so i must have got excited and spoke a little bit louder and triggered it um yep Oh, and it's, yeah, if I speak just that little bit louder, it's going to trigger it. So we are getting a few different images, but our original one has gone away. So we can prove that they're different by, let's put something else in the field of view, we'll put a toy shipping container down there. And I think I spoke while I was over there and close to it. Yep. So we've triggered that. So now we've got something where we've got a workflow that is um putting images into the system when something happens and as i was saying we can build up what that when something is by adding some more sensors if we wanted to and then we can also determine whether that something needs to appear in the front end or be brought to the attention of a person who's working like whatever this stream of images is maybe it's like you know security and it's like oh, we've triggered something. Someone go look at the image right now and see if there's a person in it doing something they shouldn't be. Or um, if we're looking at cars, can we see the license plate of the car that just drove through the red light or whatever? So we've got triggers and we've got images. And what I want to do in a future live stream for this is add some sort of um, hopefully processing of the actual image data so figure out something we can do to determine what's in the image or something like that and also add some more metadata so i was hoping with this sensor to be able to add essentially the the level of noise that triggered it so then we could uh use the front end and search for things like oh i want noisy things that happened in the night so when the noise was high and the lux was low um i mean we could use the the time here to determine the night but maybe just noisy things that happened in in the dark um or things that happened in really good light when you know it's the opposite and we've potentially got a really good picture of the animal or whatever that we can use for some other purposes so i want to do something like that in a future live stream um and that's going to mean figuring out how to get the uh the analog values out of this this sensor which we weren't able to do in time for this one it's essentially a binary trip switch for this one but having those in there will mean that i can then go and update my redis index add that as another numerical field and then we can search by it 
and you know combine it with other clauses and then we can build a front end that does some some potentially interesting things and hopefully i could stick the raspberry pi somewhere more interesting on my network than uh the office here and get some pictures of some more interesting things that are really triggered by things going on in real life so that was about it for today's stream so relatively short and simple one so we changed how the camera fires and let's see if uh, any of these are not quite expired yet so three minutes old that one's coming up to expiry um it'll disappear eventually and what you'll see is i was also just selecting the first nine um for the front end so when these start to expire you'll see some of the old ones the pictures of the boats and the shipping containers and stuff come back because i didn't have expiry on those because they were just test data um but yeah we haven't fired one for a few minutes this one's about to disappear you get the idea we're, we're sort of managing the data here um so what i'm gonna aim to do next time out is hopefully have some more metadata in here and then we can start to focus probably on this front end and the searching in the flask application rather than uh, the capturing of the data i think we've pretty much got you know capturing of data is is looking reasonably good we just need to tweak it a bit to get a few more data values and then we can start actually you know drilling down into those and building some sort of workflow that maybe somebody could use for something so key points here are you could put images in redis because redis strings are binary safe um you do need to remember what format you put them in there because the thing that reads them out needs to know that and i'm just using mime types for that we covered how that works in a previous stream um but you could use you know, whatever other metadata makes sense or just have some sort of common understanding between your two components that this field in this hash or JSON document or whatever structure it is that you're using in Redis uh, contains something that's encoded in this particular manner. Um, the other thing that we could potentially do with this is short video bursts. So the camera support short video bursts might be something that we look at in the future. I would love to know if you have any ideas where this project could go because you know I've got some ideas, but if viewers want to see certain things, because this is how this project started off in the first place, somebody was asking me about image data. And I was like, you know what? Um, rather than doing a boring theoretical explanation, let's build a practical thing that does it. If you want to get in touch with us and sort of guide the progress of this or just have any other questions about Redis generally, our developer relations team, we run a Discord. You can find it there at discord.gg slash Redis. And let's just bring it up a moment. There's a channel for all sorts. So this is the channel for um, Internet of Things projects. And we've been talking about all sorts of stuff in here. Um, so how to run Redis on a Pi 2B was a recent one. We have channels for all of the different programming languages that you might use Redis with. And then we have channels for all of the Redis University courses. So if you wanted to learn more about Redis in a structured way, we have a whole load of free courses. You can access those at university.redis.com. And let's have a quick look at that. And what you'll see when you go here is that we have a whole load of courses. They're all free. They're all available online 24 seven, and they're all do them at your own pace so when you sign up you'll be somewhere in a six week window that um you have to complete the course by but you could basically binge it all in a day if you wanted to or spread it out over a certain amount of time uh, these courses are all assessed by multiple choice exam and there is no time limit on taking that it's an open book exam we encourage you to use materials off of the internet or notes or the source code for the course that we provide in a repository or our own documentation. So we want you to succeed. And if you have questions about the courses or anything else, like I say, um, come back to Discord and we will uh, we'll be very happy to help you out. So yeah, that was it for today's stream. Um, I am just gonna clean that up a little bit. There we go. 
So yeah, where can you find this sort of stuff in the meantime? We have quite a big archive of content on the YouTube channel. Uh, you'll find for each developer advocate in our team, so Justin or Guy or Steve or myself or Brian or Savannah, we all have playlists. So if you're interested in things that one of us particularly generally talks about, so if you want to see Java stuff, go find Brian. Um, if you want to see Python stuff, Savannah has probably got you covered. If you're interested in uh, animals and capturing data about birds in a different way, Justin did a series about that that uses the Redis JSON type. So you'll find us all there. Um, in terms of when things are happening, uh, generally there'll be previews on Redis Inc on YouTube. You can find us on Twitch as well. These streams go to both places simultaneously. And we maintain a sort of upcoming events and links to all of our past ones with all of the videos on developer.redis.com slash Redis Live. So we aim to be easy to find um, and easy to interact with. But I will leave you there for today and um, I'll figure out what I'm going to do next with this project. But again, I'd love to hear what you want to see with it and um, come find us on Discord and we'll chat about it. Okay. Thanks, everybody. See you next time.